All right, welcome back. So now we'll get into chapter seven, which is 17, which is our last aspect of the local church. The local church. Brother, brother one yes. second. That in that reflection, yes. brother, he takes away. Does it mean he tries to correct our mistakes? If yes. we don't allow it, he will just leave it. Yes. So basically, here's the thing. He, through the Holy Spirit, he brings conviction. He lets us yes, know sir. that this is something in our life that we have to remove. Okay. Uh, now, he helps us to overcome it. Now, when we do want to remove it, there's nothing that, you know, the, he will not pursue. Right? He, Even in the just, case of the local church also. See, in, in, in case of the local church, the Lord can... You know, especially since it's a uh, you know it's a group of believers, it's a local church. So especially in leadership, uh, mm -hmm. the Lord. So for example, there's a leader, right? There's a sin in his life. Now we must remember that God is merciful; He's gracious also. So He'll give him a certain like he, the Lord will bring correction, will bring conviction, but there will be a certain period of time. Right. So, for example, one year or I'm not I'm just saying, right, one year or he the Lord may wait for some time. And if there is constant uh, hearts are being hardened as a leader, he is not bringing correction. Uh, he's just going to let go of it. Or what he'll do is he will remove him from leadership. Okay. Right. One of those two will uh, definitely happen. Uh, so and I think. Uh, what, uh, means the local church consists of both people uh, being fruitful as well as unfruitful. Yes. In yes. that case, how it is going to be implemented? Like. So the thing is, see, uh, fruitfulness comes by abiding. It takes time for us to become fruitful. So, for example, you, you know, in a local church, you may have somebody who's ten years in the Lord, being very yes. fruitful, and somebody mm. who's 10 months in the Lord who needs time. He can't be as fruitful as this person. Right. So I think when the Lord looks at it, he understands what season of life we are in. Right. Now, even if you look at any church across, mm. uh, uh, you know, there are people who are very strong in the Lord, very fruitful, but there are people who are, you know, for them to pray 15 minutes is a challenge. But they're very mm. good believers. Right? Here you've got others who can pray for an hour or so. Spend time intimacy with God, you know, just resting in God's presence. So I think uh, two things. One is we must understand as leaders, right? And two is those who are not able to. That's where the we we talked about, right? How can we help our okay. people in the church? So we have to teach them. Now again, we are teaching them, right? Mm. Uh, uh, now, as a church, as teach, as teachers right now, we are teaching you about the local church and you're learning so much. But it is your responsibility to take it and apply it in your life. Okay. Uh, okay. So that's that's okay. the most that we can do. Okay, brother. Thank you, brother. You're most welcome. Okay, so the last aspect of the local church, which is the lampstand. Uh, now, in the tabernacle given to Moses, it was a copy of the shadow of the true tabernacle in heaven. Right Now, let's look at what is there in the tabernacle. Right, uh, The tabernacle had an outer court, the holy place, and uh, also known as the inner place. So outer court, inner court, the most holy place, right, or the holy of holies. The outer court had the brazen altar, which was the altar of sacrifice. The inner courts had the laver, the basin with the water for washing. And the holy place had the golden lampstand, the menorah, uh, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. Three things that were there in the Holy of Holies. The golden lampstand was part of Moses' tabernacle and later became part of the temple. Once the temple was built, Solomon built the temple, all of these things went into the most holy place in the temple. Now, what is the difference? Just to help us understand. Tabernacle is something that the, the people of Israel carried around everywhere, right? Uh, uh, but now once the temple was built, it was placed in the temple. So they even when they built the temple, when Solomon built the temple, there was an outer court, inner court, most holy place. And the same things that were there in the tabernacle were placed in uh, the temple. Now, the golden ramstand was to be kept burning 
continually. The golden lampstand had seven, you've seen the menorah, right? It, uh, seven branches like candlesticks with pure olive oil and wicks. The word wicks means you, you've seen a candle, right? That little thing protruding out, which you light the fire with, that's called wicks. Each branch looked like that of an almond tree with buds, blossoms, and flowers. The lampstand was the only source of light in the holy place. Look at that. So you got the outer courts, you got the inner court, you got the most holy place. In the most holy place, or the holy of holies, is the menorah with seven lampstands. So the menorah with seven lamps, and the wick with the oil that kept it continually burning 24-7. It was burning. And this was the only source of light in that place, in the Holy of Holies. And its light shined upon the table of the showbread and the altar of incense. The lampstand provided the light necessary for the priest to partake of the showbread and work on the altar of incense. Now, this he would do once a year on the Day of Atonement. He will go into the Holy of Holies and uh, make atonement for us. Now, in the New Testament, the local church is the lampstand. Now, you see the, you, you've got that picture in your background. The outer coat, the inner coat, the Holy of Holies. Inside the Holy of Holies, it's dark. But you've got a, temp, you've got a uh, candle with uh, menorah with seven lamp, a lampstand with seven uh, candles and the light from that is continually burning, bringing light in that holy of holies. And with that light, the high priest does his sacrifices. Now, translate this to the New Testament. The Lord Jesus is saying, the church is the lampstand. The book of Revelations talks about it. It's here, Revelation chapter 1, Revelation 2. Uh, we won't read it, but what does it say? You're, you're getting a picture of, okay, just think of this, seven lampstands standing in one row, and Jesus, or maybe two rows, and Jesus is walking through those lampstands. Right? Revelations 1, 12. Right? And in the book of Revelations, the lampstands refers to the local church. The Lord moves among the lampstands and examines each lampstand to ensure that the light is shining. What is the lampstand? The local church in the New Testament. So the Lord Jesus is moving in between the lampstands to ensure that the light is burning in each lampstand. That means ensuring there is fruit happening within the local church. The local church is God's lampstand set before him in heaven, bringing his light and revelation into earth. Look at that. So beautiful. The local church, that is you and I, as believers and as, as, as a local church, it, it is God's lampstand set before him in heaven. So it's like, picture this. Jesus is sitting on his throne. There are lampstands that are set before him. He's watching the lampstands, bringing light and revelation to the earth. The local church as a lampstand is the light, uh, illuminating people's hearts and minds. How does that illumination happen? Through the teaching, understanding of God's word, through communion and prayer, uh, through preaching, worship. Everything that takes place within the church is bringing light to the people. So, if you look at it, the local church, you and I, as a local church, is bringing light to the people who are in darkness. Jesus says it beautifully. You are the light of the, uh, light of the world. You don't take a light and put it under a table, but you put it on a lampstand so that it just spreads everywhere. We are to walk as light, as people of light. We do not put, partake in the works of darkness, things that are done in secret. But as children of light, we expose the works of darkness. The Lord Jesus also says, let your light so shine that when people see it, they will praise your heavenly Father. So we see the aspect of light. We are the lampstand. Have you heard of people who said, you know, I had this bitter experience in church and now I'm no more a Christian. 
it's true. It's happened, and we know of people that way. Though what they're saying is not right, but because the church is the lampstand, we are representing the Lord Jesus Christ. And what happens is we are representing him the wrong way, and people leave the church. People don't understand why they're part of the church. So here's where we come in. Our life and our conduct must reveal that we are children of God and we must shine as light in darkness. What are some of the ways that we can practically do this? Firstly, maintain our first love. Do we love to do ministry? I love to do ministry. Do you love to preach? Love to preach. You love to teach? Love to go on missions? Beautiful. Nice time. But we can do all of this and forget our first love. That's what Paul, uh, you know, uh, sorry, uh, in the book of Revelations, John writes and he says to the church in Ephesus, you have lost your first love. You have a name among people, but you have lost your first love. You're doing a lot of things, a lot of activities, a lot of ministries, evangelism, everything you're doing, but you've lost your first love. Right? So maintain our first love so that our lampstands are burning strong. Secondly, the local church provides illumination for God's people so that they can be in a place to understand God's word and grow in prayer, in worship, in uh, you know, just their personal walk with the Lord. So a local church brings illumina illumination, brings revelation of God's word. So on Sundays or other events and programs, when we're when the pastor or the leaders are preaching, teaching, we're listening to this word. The word can bring illumination. It brings a revelation into our hearts, and then we begin to understand God's word. Right? Some simple things, you know, when we read the book of Acts and we see how Paul went into different places and ministered, uh, we try. We begin. We begin to understand. Oh, Paul went, said this to this church because this is the background of the church. The reason he said it was this. Paul said this to the Roman church because this is what their understanding was. To Ephesus, he said this. Right. So we begin to understand. It brings illumination. Encourage believers to live lives. And to do good work so that we will point people to the Lord. Uh, encourage people to live and do good works. Uh, some of the challenges. Uh, believers engaging in good worms as a form of social service. Now, is social service important? Yes. We have many people who are doing wonderful works. right? Uh, people from other faiths who you know, have destitute homes, children's homes, they're doing wonderful work. They're doing well, but they're not doing it in the name of Jesus. But are they doing well? They're doing so good. Right? But I cannot look at what I'm doing in ministry as a social work. So I must understand that, hey, I'm connected to the vine, so my fruit is out of Jesus. Whatever I do, whether it's social work, whether it's ministry, whether it's business, it is coming out of that understanding of being connected to Jesus, right? So I should never do something just so that I can gain more points in uh, Jesus's book. No, I do it because I want to reveal Jesus, point people to Jesus. Believers, sometimes we forget that uh, to focus on the first love in an attempt to be a light to the world, meaning we can come up with a defense for the gospel, we may get angry, we may get upset to prove a point. So we should avoid that. Some questions here. What if the lampstand is removed from its place in heaven but continues functioning as a local church here on earth? It can't happen because the lampstand refers to the local church, right? So uh, there's, it's going to happen only at the rapture, right? At the rapture, the local church is taken up. And this significance, the portrayal of the lampstands will be gone because we will be there as a church. Right? This is the whole point of the lampstand and all of this is for us to understand 
right? Uh, what Jesus is communicating. Then, how could the local church or believers expose the work of darkness in a proper way? How do you think we can do that? Preach, teach the word of God. Another very important aspect would be to teach believers the authority that God has given us, our identity, our authority in Christ, right? And to walk in that authority. I think that is very important to teach the local church, the believers, and also practical training on how to minister to people, right? Especially people from other faiths. How do I minister? So we learn that as well, right? So with this, we complete the 10 different perspectives of the local church, right? So we see a blend of two uh, different, many, many different uh, aspects. But one thing that's kept coming out in all of these 10 is we see the church as a family, but we also see the church as a army. Two, it's like a contradiction. Hey, you're a family, but you're also an army. We need to love each other, but we also need to fight against the enemy. Right? So these are the 10 different perspectives of the local church. So <clears throat> building according to God's design. Now, we this is the same. Uh, what we'll do is if you look at the page 175, you have God's blueprint. That's what we have uh, talked about all, all, all this time. Uh, but there's an assessment on page 177, so maybe you can do that in your break time if you feel you want to just assess. I know many of you have to still, you know, looking to start a church, or, uh, or but then you can look at it as believers. You can make a self-assessment if you'd like to. But now let's move on to the third section, section three, talking about order of the local church, right? Chapter 19. The sacraments of the church. Now, a lot of this is very common to us. We know it. But let's just quickly look at it. Right? There are sacraments and ordinances in the church. Uh, and two important sacraments that we normally follow is the water baptism and uh, the Lord's table. Two of these, right? Uh, so as believers, we follow this. We, we must obey these two. Uh, we must participate. We must let the work of God, the power of God to work in our lives, even as we partake of this. Now, the reason we have this is because God has commanded us. It's not a time of, uh, uh, you know, since church is one and a half hours, let's fill up some time. Uh, no, no, no. These are ordinances. These are sacraments. These are things that God has ordained for the church and you and I as believers to do and to follow. Right. So let's look at a few, two of them. One is firstly water baptism. Introduced by John the Baptist. Now I'll, I'll just go quickly. Right. John the Baptist was baptism of. Yeah. But what is it called? Baptism of repentance. And the Lord Jesus came and he said. Jesus, John the Baptist himself testified and said, one coming after me will baptize in this fire and in the Holy Spirit. So what is baptism? The Lord Jesus himself went and was water baptized. Baptism is an expression of your decision and my decision to follow Jesus alone. Now, it's a, it's a outward expression. So we, are, we are telling people, hey, I am for, going to follow Jesus. I'm a believer. And the moment I get into this water, it's, a, it's an inner experience of the death burial and resurrection of Jesus written in Romans 6. Right? So it's like this. Think of this. You go into the water. You're, you become a believer. You go into the water. The moment you go into the water is the death of your old self. Now, I'm talking about it figuratively, right? You go into the water, you're buried. You come out of the water, you are resurrected. So what are you doing? You're signifying the Lord Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So water baptism is, your, is the death of our old self, burial of our old self, and resurrection as new believers. Now this would have happened maybe even in a prayer, right? You prayed and said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, make me a new person. Right? You become a believer. 
This is a outward expression of what you are saying and what you are believing. Right? Baptism is an expression of your desire to maintain a clear conscience before God. So basically, you're saying, you think, God, this is me telling that I have a you, you, you know, I want to maintain a clear conscience before you. The only requirement to be baptized is repent and believe. And one of the most common questions that come up is, should I, to, to be water baptized, should I, have, should I be five years in the Lord? No. Should I be speaking in tongues? Not necessarily. Should I have the gift of prophecy or the baptism of the Holy Spirit before I go into the, uh, only then I can get into water baptism? Not necessary. Should I know the whole book of uh, you know Genesis to Revelations? Not necessary. You do. You, you should know hundred verses. Not necessary. You should be a uh, you know uh, associate pastor or you should be whatever. Not necessary. There is no prerequisite. Only one thing is that you repent and believe the Lord Jesus is your personal savior. Now, there may be people who will come and say, you know what, you don't be water baptized, you need time. Uh, you know, you have to do 40 days of fasting. Now, that is a personal decision. Right? That's a personal decision. That's something that we personally want to follow. Now, for example, before I was water, before I thought I'd get water baptized, I fasted and prayed. Then I got water baptized. Now, it's not like when I went into the water, the water split into two and I came out with, the, in a, with one, you know, two angels helped me out, nothing. Everyone who came got water baptized, got up and went home. Nothing changed. Only thing is I had biryani that day. Everything else it was the same. Right? But in the night, I kept thinking, made physical... I've made a declaration. I'm now my conscience. Whatever I do, I must do it for the Lord. I belong to Him. And now, not only in church, but wherever I am in my home, the way I speak to people, the way I relate to my friends, everything changes. Right? So, baptism is by immersion in water only, not taking water like this and putting on the face. That is not. Water baptism. The word baptize means immerse. Right? Not sprinkling of water. It's not uh, baptism. Yes, you have a question? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, as we know, this water baptism is the repentance. Like It's referring repentance. So people used to ask what sin Jesus did. So he also took yeah. baptism. So how to explain? Yeah, that's a very... See, Jesus did not sin. But he did it to set an example for us. Right? The reason, even John the Baptist said, why are you coming to me? I must be baptized by you. But Jesus said, let it be so this time. So what is Jesus doing? He's setting an example for us. right? Now, later I think it's there in this book. I'm not sure if it's there in this, but there are some practices we follow now. There are some practices we don't follow in the church. Jesus set an example of water baptism. Should we be water baptized? Yes. Jesus set an example on the Lord's table. Should we partake of the Lord's table? Yes. Jesus set an example of washing other people, uh, the disciples' feet. Should we wash others' feet? Should we do exactly by washing others' feet? No. No, it's the no. answer. Yeah, the answer is no. Very simple. We don't have to wash people's feet. Right? So there are some practices that we follow and some we don't, right? So here, the Lord Jesus, we know he didn't sin. He's, he did it so that it's an example for us. The other way to look at it is to say, is, hey, Jesus only got water baptized, so even I should get water baptized. It's important that we do it. Right? Uh, he was setting an example for us. Now, Jesus washed everyone's feet. So let me sit and wash everyone's feet. It's a waste of time. What did Jesus say? Let your words, let your actions be louder. Right? We don't see an account of the disciples washing others' feet. None of that. We don't see it happening in the local church, in the early church. We don't see an account of it. They may have done it, 
but then they realized it was not more about just washing others feet and then talking behind their back again yeah, i might as well don't wash the feet and talk behind their back so it was more of an act of service and servanthood yeah yeah again these are practices which they, i have washed people when we go to i think it was uh, earlier i used to go to uh, uh, especially hyderabad andhra pradesh and you go to uh, uh, north india i i washed people's feet it's a custom there they said can you wash the feet i said okay no it's a custom so i washed the feet then i told them then i taught them because i didn't want to hurt them now i was new i was just probably one year in the lord but i understood that it was not for that season but something they believe but i didn't want to be in a place of you know i knew i'm preaching the next entire week i didn't want to say no i'll wash i'll not wash your feet now they it's like cutting off their nose and giving them a rose to smell i washed their feet and i preached and i taught them right we had sessions the whole day and then some of them understood so then why you washed our feet is it's okay but now you understand what it is so the pastor also said okay going forward we don't have to do this we don't have to right so yeah pastor during uh, christening time and uh, name so, so many that time we take the water baptism the infant baptism in church so a uh, sprinkling so now for us is it like a uh, kind of mandatory to take water baptism or is that also a part of baptism which is there and then we continue growing the lord with the communion in okay two things one is the word baptism means immersion in water so the so it's the baby or the child is not immersed in water okay so it's not a baptism two is the child is not yet in a place to understand that what baptism is right so you can be sprinkle baptized or whatever sprinkling uh, of water uh, but it's not water baptism water baptism is immersion of water and it is done in a time when you and i are matured enough to understand what it is all about right now for the for the child for example if i take my son my smaller one right he's uh, he's what 7 years old if i say come water baptism he'll start playing he'll say can i bring my toys inside the pool inside the tank he's not going to understand but my elder one he may understand a little because i he has seen me baptizing people so he keeps asking me and he's learning in children's church so somewhere there's that understanding but the revelation is still not there i believe he'll need at least another 3 if he's if he understands that's good he need a couple of years more right so maybe when he's 12 he'll really begin to understand so every now and then i keep telling him what it is what it means so the understanding should come now as a baby the baby has no idea what is happening right so it's not counted as water baptism at all there are times also in i would say in some of the mainline churches people at a certain age you have to get water baptized just like confirmation uh, or, or you know you have to get water baptized now again they may get water baptized but if there's there's no significance there's no meaning to it right it's like doing something just because you're doing it and there's no meaning to it right so we must understand that right? when we do something we should understand why we are doing it yeah all denominations have water baptism uh, so what we do is we dedicate the child we have child dedication so we, when when parents come we take the child whether yes yes almost all churches yes again the emphasis is not there on it right so for example yeah it it example there are some churches uh you know like uh, which don't really focus on the gifts of the holy spirit they don't focus on water baptism this i have the word all of that may be good but there's no focus on that so yeah it is it is important to take yes right it is now again it's not a prerequisite to go to heaven only if i get water baptized i'll enter heaven yeah so that spirit of water is not oh, not talk, not talking about water baptism it's talking about born in the spirit no unforeseen circumstance so so for example see uh, a person has become a believer right it's been one month 
Now he's going on a train journey to his hometown. The train meets with an accident. Unfortunately, he passes away. Now, in the gates of heaven, they're not going to ask, well, okay, one month over, why you didn't get back? Water baptism is not there. Sorry, you can't enter. That doesn't make sense. Right? But now if it's, you know, I've, a person has become a believer, it's been 10, 15 years, right? And he's not been water baptized. Something happens. He gets into, uh, I mean, he, he uh, you know, he passes away. He goes to heaven. Now, again, we'll be judged for our deeds and for the things that we've done. It's not like God is going to say, okay, no water baptism, no entrance. No. The only criteria to get into heaven is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? These are things that is our responsibility. It helps us, not God. Right? <laughs> our responsibility. Right? Water baptism will not make you a spiritual giant. Once you come out of that water, it doesn't mean I'll learn of Psalms 139 completely. You have to prepare and learn it. Right? It doesn't make you all-knowing, all-understanding. We have to uh, grow spiritually through word and prayer. Because baptism is an act of obedience, you can expect increased measure of blessing. Now, listen to this. There could be a person, you become a believer, says, hey, the Bible says we have to be water baptized. And it's important. So I prepare myself. Say I take a week, right? Prepare myself. Say, God, I want to be water baptized. I want to surrender my life to you. The moment I am water baptized, I am opening my life to the blessings of the cross, to the work of the Holy Spirit in a greater measure into my life. I can expect the blessings of God to flow in, in a greater level of maturity, in a greater level of power, right? I can expect it to grow in. Baptism is a symbolic proclamation of the cross. You can expect the power of the cross to break bondages, addictions, bring deliverance during baptism. Now, think of this. You can be, you know, just think of this. Maybe there's a person, he has become a believer. An example, right? He's blind in one night. He hasn't prayed, nothing. He's just become a believer and he says, I want to be water baptized. He can go into that water, come out, and both his eyes and his eyes can be healed without any prayer. Why? Because he's opening his life to the to the blessings of the cross, to the power of the cross. What is there in the power of the cross? Healing, deliverance. Right? Or there may be somebody who's you know going through something, weakness or fear. Every time there's fear in their life, they come out of the water, suddenly there's no fear. So these are things that can happen. Now, how do we baptize? We baptize in water saying, in Jesus' name, I baptize you in the Father, the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. When we say in Jesus' name, we, we are means we are in His place. We represent Him and we act on His behalf. So it's basically not the pastor who is uh, baptizing you. We are representing Jesus. So he's saying, in Jesus' name, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? Now, can, can I baptize? Should I wait to become a pastor? Not necessarily. Should I wait to reach a certain uh, you know, level of maturity? Not necessarily. If you get an opportunity, do it. Right? Uh, but now, as the church has evolved, we have you know, water baptism certificate. Something that we have at APC is our a uh, water baptism consent form. So if somebody wants to be water baptized, they have to write a letter. Uh, there's a letter, that form that we have. They fill in that form saying, I am getting baptized on my own will. On I want to do it. Nobody's forcing me to do this. So we have a baptism consent form and all of that. So, uh, so I think once you begin a church or begin a ministry, have all this in place so that in the future it doesn't become uh, a problem. Right? So we know about water baptism. Let's get into the Lord's table. Pastor, yeah. uh, can we take baptism two times? If the first time you didn't really understand it and you were forced to take it or you were not spiritually, you didn't understand it, then yeah, you can take it again. But don't just take it because I feel like taking. Don't feel like, don't say like, you know, 
hey uh, five years over i want to renew my commitment let me go get water baptized again renewing commitment doesn't mean water baptism some people go to jordan and take uh, second time baptism no there's no difference it can be jordan it can be uh, saint joseph's swimming pool it's the same thing <laughs> and then see all see there, there's this emotional aspect also right some of them want to go to the sea of galilee and jump into the water now sea of galilee and all you try it is a problem firstly you'll get arrested right uh, two is it's a sea it's not a pond it's not a lake right so i think it's not about uh, of course that emotional thing hey jesus was here or you know jesus came here but water baptism is not merely about a location it's about it's a spiritual thing it's not a physical aspect right we are identifying with this death burial and resurrection we are not identifying with where jesus was or where he lived all that is secondary if you want to get into the water dip yourself do it but then doing it simply for you know just because it's jordan it doesn't for me i feel it doesn't make sense because you've already done it why would you want to do it again but if there's a person who's you know when they were small they just did it just for the sake of doing it uh, and they didn't really understand and they want to be water baptized again they can right okay all right let's get into the lord's table now the lord's table is a sacrament which the lord himself has instituted he gave his revelation sorry he spoke to his disciples in front of all the disciples he said he explained it to them then he exp- he gave it to the apostle paul through revelation and now the lord's table is open to all believers something that we announce at church at apc is we say if you are a believer in the lord you believe in the lord jesus christ as your personal savior welcome to partake of the lord's table right now there is it comes to abhishek i just saw your question here is it necessary to take baptism again when you understand later what baptism is now if you've not understood the first time if you've just taken it because people have forced you or you felt that everyone are taking so even i want to take um you can do it once more but make sure you understand why you're doing it you should be very clear about the understanding what happens what you're doing in water baptism yeah okay so the lord's table one of the question that comes up is should i be water baptized and only then partake in the lord's table not necessary right again the prerequisite is you have to be a believer in jesus you believe him as your personal savior nobody can say don't take lord's table because you're not water baptized if somebody is saying that it's wrong it's unbiblical it's important to be water baptized but just because you're not water baptized nobody can stop you from partaking in the lord's table right so what is the lord's table it's an expression of your personal our personal faith in the death burial and resurrection of the lord we are proclaiming the completed work of the cross when we partake in the lord's table it's an expression of our faith uh in his return and it's an expression of our union with jesus an expression of our covenant with one another when we look at the old testament god established this very powerful covenant through abraham and he, it was a blood covenant right god established the blood covenant here in the new testament the lord jesus himself is the establisher of the blood covenant and he's he's saying i'm in, i'm inviting all of us as believers to be part of this blood covenant this time this covenant is not of the blood of animals and goats and all of that but the blood of jesus himself right uh, it's an expression of our covenant relationship with the lord jesus and for example we are all partaking of the lord's table together as a local church we are it's a covenant relationship with the lord jesus but it's also a covenant relationship that we have with each other we are brothers and sisters in christ we are part partakers of a new covenant we belong to god right so it's it's very powerful you know just the picture 
So every time as pastors, when we picture the church just holding that elements and you know taking it together, it brings so much of unity. It's powerful. We're inviting the power of the cross to enter into our lives. Right? We are making a determination to to love one another, to to care for one another, to respect one another, to avoid backbiting, to avoid mistrust, to commit one to one another, to build a relationship with one another. Now, what must we do before partaking in the Lord's table? Same, just as how we prepare when it comes to uh, water baptism, we have to prepare our hearts, examining our lives uh, and renouncing sin when we partake in the Lord's table. So something that we uh, you know, encourage believers is we say, you know, even as we partake of this, let us renounce any sin. Let's ask God to forgive our sins. The Holy Spirit may remind us of things sins that we may have committed knowingly and unknowingly, let the power of the cross, this blood that was shed, bring forgiveness and healing into our lives. And so we prepare our hearts. Taking the elements, understanding and believing on the finished work of the cross. Very important is um, to partake of it in a worthy manner. Now, let's quickly look at this. And see if we can complete this. The church in Corinthians, what was the problem? The problem was they were all good believers, flowing in the gifts of the Spirit, but they were partaking in the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. For example, the Lord's table is kept there on the table. People will go, take one, pound, one portion of bread, take a little wine, drink and come and sit. And another group is coming and coming and taking whenever they feel like. There was disorder. There was no unity. People were like having food, no, like fellowship time. They were talking to each other and having the Lord's table. So Paul, Paul said, no, that's wrong. When you partake of the Lord's table, it's not, that's why he writes and he says, don't you have foods to, sorry, don't you have homes to eat food and uh, drink? Why do you come to the Lord's table and partake of it in an unworthy manner? So basically what he's saying is, is when we are partaking of this, we must take it in reverence. We are remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. Remembering it. We're thinking of it. We're thinking of his body that was bruised, the blood that was shed on the cross. We're thinking of his resurrection and the power of the cross. We're thinking of how he defeated sin. He destroyed sin. He destroyed the enemy. We're thinking of all that. And now you're talking about, you know, what you had for lunch, what you had for dinner. Oh, it, you know, they're just making it a time of joke. Paul was upset. So here's what he says. There were two ways in which they were violating the Lord's table. One is they were partaking in the Lord's table and then also partaking in of food sacrificed to idols as an act of worship. And Paul called this idolatry. The real problem was not with the food, but with the reverence that was being given to the idol. So now, You've got food sacrificed to idols. These people, we must understand a little bit of the background. The Corinthian church was known for its idol worship. And now these people are eating food sacrificed to idols. They're coming here, partaking in the Lord's table. Now Paul writes and he says, can you be part of both the, the, the devil and of Jesus? Can light and darkness stay together? He goes on to write that, right? Uh, so what happened is, is it became a stumbling block to new believers. New believers are looking at them and saying, hey, last week I saw you eating all those food sacrificed to idols, sitting with all these people, um, you know, the Gentiles, and, you know, you were eating with them. You know it's food sacrificed to idols, but now you're coming here and eating this. It became a stumbling block to the new believers. They didn't understand what was happening. Secondly, they turned the Lord's table into some sort of feast, time of enjoyment, but it's not. It's not a time of en it's a Yes, it's a joyful thing to partake, but it's not for enjoying. It's not a time of enjoying with each other. Right? Here Paul later on writes that because people have taken it in an unworthy manner, 
That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have also died prematurely because they have dishonored the body of Christ. So, very important lesson. You and I as believers, when we are partaking in the Lord's table, remember to partake of it in honor, remembering the cross, remembering what Jesus did for us. Right? Don't be talking, don't be looking here and there. Try to focus your mind, your attention to the cross. It's a very, very holy sacrament that we are partaking of. And some of the things I tell the church is I say, when the Lord's table is happening, don't let people to come keep walking and entering the church. It's like, hey, let's finish it. It's very important that we uh, do it the right way. Now, what is the requirement? There is no spiritual requirement. There is no age requirement. When I say spiritual requirement, does it mean spiritual maturity? No. Right? The only requirement is that the person is a born again, has personal faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only requirement that is needed. Nothing more. What about age? If there is a 10-year-old who is who really has become matured, understands about the cross, understands what Jesus did on the cross, and if they want to partake in the Lord's table, we are nobody to stop them. Now again. We must ensure that they understand what it is. If I see this 10-year-old saying, I understand, but he takes the Lord's table and he's talking and he's smiling and laughing and doing all that, then I'll tell him, don't take it. Because he's still not yet understood the, the reverence that needs to be, that it has to be done in. Right? So remember this. There's no prerequisite. Whether it's water baptism, whether it is partaking in the Lord's table. Uh, Here's your, some of the common questions. If I was baptized before, either sprinkled or just through immersion, is it necessary and all right to be? Yes, it is all right to be baptized again and do it as an expression of your faith. Right? So that answers your question. Secondly, do I need to reach some spiritual level of maturity? You answer it. No. Can a believer baptize another believer? Yes, we see it in the book of Acts. Ananias baptized uh, Saul. What if I look, took the Lord's table in an unworthy manner, not really understanding or having faith in what I was doing? Will I be struck down with some deadly disease? No. Just recognize that you took it lightly. Take some time. Say, Lord, please forgive me for not uh, taking it in a worthy manner. And keep moving. Do it the right way. That's it. You can just take it at home. Do it the right way. Ask God for forgiveness. Lord, forgive me for if I've done it the wrong way. And then move on. Finally, should I partake of the Lord's table when the person leading the celebration himself does not believe what he is doing? There's no value in doing it that way. Right? Uh, but if the person who's leading the uh, Lord's table, uh, he doesn't understand. We partake and we are here and we believe in it then God will work in our lives. Right? It's a personal faith. If he doesn't believe he's leading it, that's his problem. He's not going to open his life to the work of the cross. right? But if, if we have no other option, we do it. We partake of it, believing. Can I, as a believer, take the partake of the Lord's table at home? Yes. At all times, anytime, we can. Right? Right, so we'll stop here. We'll come back for the next session, for the next course of uh, Ministry of the Evangelist, Pastor and Teacher. Right, thank you, everyone. I'll see you next class. God bless.